one. Are you sure? Yes. They called it the Pillar of Autumn. Why was it not destroyed with the rest of their fleet? It fled as we set fire to their planet. But I followed with all the ships in my command. When you first saw Halo, were you blinded by its majesty? Blinded? Paralyzed? Dumbstruck? No. Yet the humans were able to evade your ships, land on the sacred ring, and desecrate it with their filthy footsteps. Noble hierarchs, surely you understand that once the parasite attacked... Once the parasite attacked? Surely the parasite would not have been a problem had you done your job, shipmaster. The weight of your heresy leaves this council with great doubt. I will continue my campaign against the humans. No, you will not. The desecration of the Holy Ring marks a new age for the Covenant, one this council has pondered heavily on for a long time. Your commitment to the great journey is at question. The commitment of your entire fleet. Noble Prophet of Truth, this has gone on long enough. Make an example of this bundler. The Council demands it. You are one of our most treasured instruments. Long have you led your fleet with honor and distinction. But your inability to safeguard Halo was a colossal failure. Hey, it was heresy. Soon the great journey shall begin. But when it does, the weight of your heresy will stay your feet, and you shall be left behind. Today we look at what could have been if the destruction of the first Halo accelerated the inevitable, the Great Schism. The separation of a multi-millennia covenant between prophets and the lies that begot them the greatest empire seen in a hundred millennia. This what if was originally proposed by Fallen. He did not email me with any specifics, so I had free reign over this scenario. The main points he did, however, want me to cover and get across, well, you'll see in a little. So let's get into it. How much further must we heft this baggage? Any cell will do. Why not toss him in with this lot? They could use the meat. Them? What about us? My belly aches, and his flesh is seared just the way I like it. Quiet! You two whimper like grunts fresh off the teat. He's not meant for the jails. The hierarchs have something special in mind. You may leave, Tartarus. But I thought... And take your brutes with you. Release the prisoner. Replace those incompetents and healy fools. They can no longer be trusted to shepherd the way to the great journey. Noble hierarchs, the elites have always been the honor guard to guide us to the great journey. Silence! Your kind was useful when this covenant began, but the elites have cost us too much. Your execution is set for tomorrow, at the break of dawn. Your commanders will be put to the sword with you as well, for their heresy. I beg of you, noble Hierarch, do not do this to them. I am the one with a sullied honor, not them. Your entire race will be discarded of. Unless you can shed your dishonor and ascend to Arbiter, will you die for the great journey? Prove your commitment by destroying a true heretic, and you shall be set loose with our blessing. Our prophets are false. 
Open your eyes, my brothers. They will use the faith of our forefathers to bring ruin to us all. The great journey is a... This heretic and those who follow him must be silenced. This slander offends all who walk the path. What use am I? I can no longer command ships, lead troops into battle. Not as you are, no. But become the Arbiter. And you shall be set loose against this heresy with our blessing. What of the Council? The tasks you must undertake as the Arbiter are perilous, suicidal. You will die as each Arbiter has before you. The Council will have their corpse. What would you have your Arbiter do? Thelvadam reluctantly accepts becoming the Arbiter for the small chance to redeem his honor and that of the rest of his kind. The real heretics must be slain. Our story has already fundamentally changed. The prophets have become extremely hostile towards the elites and almost unreasonably hysterical. Yes, the destruction of the Halo was one of the greatest tragedies to happen in the entire history of the Covenant. But to punish all elites for Thel Vadami's failure is unreasonable to them. Removing and replacing the honor guard seems like a huge blow to the elites. While the Arbiter goes on his first mission to execute the heretic, back at High Charity, events are unfolding fast. Some elites are truly distraught and furious over the change of the honor guard. Others have completely begun to question the hierarchs, while a small few are trying to piece together just why the Prophets have reacted in such a way. This overreaction must have been triggered by the Prophets wanting to hide something from the elites. But why would they want to hide anything from them? The entire covenant began with the two of them, the elites and Prophets. This faction of elites begins to come to the conclusion rapidly that the most important thing to them is the great journey and their honor and they know the Prophets are using that against them. They review report logs and activity logs to fill in the gaps. And it all leads back to one thing, the demon. The Master Chief. There's something they cannot explain. He had been fighting the Flood and disappeared. The next thing they knew, he was on the other side of the ring with a sacred relic, a sacred icon, and in the control room. That should have been impossible for the human demon. The Covenant had studied the demons for decades and they hadn't known them to be able to teleport. That technology had been out of their grasp. The only thing that could explain it was if he had access to Forerunner technology. But someone must have helped them for that. One more thing was strange to them. They had managed to confirm the the existence of the Oracle. It had been on board the Pillar of Autumn, the human vessel. It knew of the demon's intent to blow up the ring, but how? Had the two of them met already? If so, why would the Oracle have any dealings with a demon? Their entire race desecrated the relics left behind by the Forerunners. Surely the Oracle would hate them just as much as the Covenant did, but there was no other way around it. The demon had been teleported across several locations on the Holy Ring, but the only one capable of that would have been the Oracle himself. This new faction of elites has a lot of pieces but can't quite put the puzzle together yet. They plan to wait for the Arbiter's return for more news about what had happened on the Ring, but things are about to go from bad to worse on board High Charity. All the Meanwhile, the missions Arbiter and Oracle are going on this time. The elites that were sent were close allies to the Arbiter before his shame of failing to protect the holy relic of Halo. Once again amongst them is Shipmaster Ratas Vatum. One more huge difference here is that Tartarus has brought a lot of brutes but chooses not to deploy them. They all see this as strange. Why would they even come here if not to help? They understand the Prophets must want to keep an eye on them, but these brutes are all extremely well equipped. Rataz is the first one to put this puzzle together. The Brutes aren't here to help them. There's not much they can do about it for now. Their main concern is the destruction of the Heretic and his forces, as well as stopping the Parasite. 
The rest of the events of the Arbiter and the Oracle missions transpire just as usual. However, there's a small change towards the end. Once the Monitor 343 Guilty Spark arrives and meets the Arbiter, Tartar's ship approaches to land. With his brutes in escort, Shipmaster Ratas was waiting for this all along. Seeing the brutes land now when the Arbiter is all alone, he has his phantom approach Tartarus's but stays hidden to observe. The Monitor does not get much time to talk unfortunately, but the Heretic also doesn't shoot the Arbiter, instead he shoots Tartarus's forces. The Brutes move in to attack the Heretic, but also the Arbiter. Fel of Atomy tries to reason with them momentarily. A bloody fate awaits you and the rest of your incompetent race. And I, Tartarus, chieftain of the Brutes, will send you to it. And the Prophets learn of this, that they will take your head when they learn. <laughs> Fool, they ordered me to do it. This is all Ratas needs to hear. He comes out of hiding and his phantom takes down the other phantom waiting for Tartarus. The elites land and go forth to fight the brutes. Ultimately victorious as the last remaining foe is Tartarus. He uses his hammer to pull in 343 Guilty Spark and use him as a hostage. This makes some of the elites extremely mad and swear that they will skin him for it. The coward brute uses the monitor to protect himself and refusing to hurt the oracle causes several of the elites to be injured or outright killed. Tartarus is finally defeated when the heretic picks up one of the dead elite's swords and he uses his hologram device to fool the brute. The heretic appears behind Tartarus and splits him open from navel to mouth. The brute's corpse falls and the elites tend to the wounded. The monitor insists on destroying the flesh of those killed so the flood cannot repurpose their biomass. All elites agree. In the meantime though, the monitor tells the Halo's true purpose. None of them were expecting it. To the Oracle, it was just a normal conversation, but to them, it was shattering news on the level of discovering the entire covenant was built on lies. Furthermore, the Forerunners were not gods, and they certainly didn't ascend to become gods when the Halos were activated. They also now understand how truly deadly the Flood are. They may no longer revere the Forerunners as gods anymore, but they still respect them. Also, breaking old habits will be very hard. Taking this info harshly, they don't get a chance to come up with a plan however, as the storm approaches and they need to get going. They all board the Phantom as well as the Heretic, while they continue to bombard the Guilty Spark with questions. The the Arbiter, however, sits back and takes off his helmet. He looks it over, he runs through the events in his mind. In the middle of the confusion, he hears an elite say, Shipmaster, High Charity is under attack. Rataz approaches the monitor and says, Have the humans come for an early execution? Felvatami dies at this moment, and Felvadam rises. He says, No, it is the end of our covenant. As the display monitor shows thousands of ships around High Charity fighting one another. The Phantom there on board begins to come under fire by several space banshees. The Phantom takes heavy damage and just as the group thinks they're gonna be blown out of space, Shipmaster Hazel Vorkmi comes over the radio. You shall receive safe passage to the shadow of intent, Arbiter. The Arbiter quickly asks what's going on, and the Shipmaster explains that while they were away in their mission, the Covenant began to utterly fall apart. A group of elites had been assassinated inside High Charity. They had been branded as heretics and liars, but unaware to the assassins, the group was there to discuss the changing of the elite honor guard, and there was a witness as well as a lone survivor. It's an Healy priestess by the name of Rima Zalan, who was brought here directly from Sanhelius for a mating pact. She had joined the group not because she was a heretic, but because she wanted to dissuade the heretics from their line of thinking. She was trying to keep them in the righteous path of the great journey. But when the group was attacked, she was given their only cloaking unit, and she survived by remaining out of combat and hiding. A lot of elites took disgust with the idea. She had no honor if she chose not to fight. But others understood she was no shipmaster, she was no warrior, and she was the only one of her name. If she died, the house of Zalan would be extinct in both name and blood. Her account of the happening had been that a hit squad of brutes with honor guard markings and zealot strength shields had attacked the unprepared elites. She explains that many believe she explains that many believed them to be heretics, but all they sought was some guidance and some answers. But the murder of the elites by the prophet's guards pushed the entire conflict of faith aside. This had quickly become an interspecies war. After the Prophet's remarks about the Sanghili race and removing them from honor guard, followed by these assassinations, the elites had enough of the Prophet's dishonor. Fleet master and shipmaster of the fastest fleet in the Covenant Armada, the fleet of Worthy Alliance, Hazel Vorkmi, 
had instigated a great schism. He was no heretic, but the destruction of the holy relic Halo and the naming of a new arbiter immediately followed by this assassination on board their holy city meant the prophets were keeping secrets from the elites. This rebellion inspired other fleet masters and soon enough the Covenant found themselves in an all-out war against one another. Before Hassel can continue, the Phantom reaches the shadow of intent, with Vadum now being its shipmaster. He sets a rally point for him and Hassel to meet up. The battle around High Cherry is still raging on, but without more information, Vadum doesn't know who to side with, especially after having the Monitor tell them everything about Installation 04. Vorkmi agrees and instructs his ships and allies to disengage. This kind of brings the Great Schism to a small halt as other fleets see the two bigger fleets disengage and take off into subspace. Some immediately follow, and others just go their separate way. The Great Schism isn't over, but the biggest and most important step had been taken. The Covenant has officially been split up into dozens of different little factions, but mainly into three. The one still calling itself the Covenant Empire, the believers of the Great Journey. The one calling itself the Swords of St. Helios, which we will touch on soon enough. And the third faction mainly consists of non-believers and those who feel betrayed by the prophets. This faction has the smaller fleet, but amongst them there's more variety. While the Swords of St. Helios consist of mainly elites with a very little percentage of grunts and hunters, this faction has all sorts of races, from buggers to brutes and elites, similar to how the Banish has all sorts of races at its disposal. The main defining trait of this group is their disillusionment with the Great Journey. They don't believe in it anymore, but they aren't anywhere near as powerful as the Covenant outright, nor the Swords of St. Helios, so they decide to play along while having a reluctant alliance with the Xeno-exclusivist elite. While still trying to figure out their own ways, the Swords of St. Helios create an alliance with a newer faction. They all meet in orbit of St. Helios, so they can put all the pieces together. Finally getting to hear the story from the Monitor himself and adding all the events that happened on board High Charity, the meeting leads them all to ponder what they should do about the humans. They have been at war for so long and no one has any love for them, but they are the Forerunner's chosen people to reclaim their old technology. On the other hand, they were weak and on the border of being driven into extinction, and yet they refused to die. By all means, the human race should have lost the war against the Covenant long ago, but their honor was different than the elites. Eventually, they all had come to agree that the humans would be given a chance to join the Alliance, but only one chance. Everyone now understood the Forerunners were not gods, and and that would be something they would have to deal with for centuries down the line. They also discussed the elite in attendance that no one had invited. Swordmaster Zuzo Votin, born of a lower clan and used by the prophets until they sent him and his comrades to execute Aatrox, leader of the Vanished. Very much like his foes, all of his comrades and allies had died that day except him. Zuzo had no business with either faction in orbit of St. Helios, but when he found out that the prophets had built the covenant around lies, and those lies cost his friends and allies their lives, he chose to join the Swords of St. Helios, if only to have the resources needed to reach the prophets' throats. The elite did not sit, but merely kept his back to a wall. He sported a long torn red cloak and an energy sword on each side of his hip. On his back, he carried several more energy swords, broken ones. If they had any power, it could not be said, but they belonged to his old comrades and thus he would never do without them. All members of this meeting were wary of him. Even the Arbiter himself did not dare give him orders, but soon enough they realized he was on their side. The meeting adjourned after agreeing to merge their fleets and allow other species into their alliance, even brutes and humans. Together they were to launch an attack on High Charity and end the San Shayum, and eventually approach the humans for a truce. None of them understood the miscalculation they were making though. The Great Schism had served in the way of saving the humans, but all also dooming them in an unpredictable way. The remaining prophets, Prophet of Truth and Prophet of Mercy, as the Prophet of Regret had been killed on board a St. Healy controlled ship as soon as sides were chosen by the crew and its escorting fleet. The two prophets had gathered all the Covenant forces left and began planning an assault on Earth. Because of the Great Schism, the battle for Earth had been delayed by several months. On the eve of 2553, the Covenant would launch an attack on Earth with a fleet three times the size the one that attacked Reach. April 21st, 2553. The Covenant have glassed over 90% of the surface of Earth. This battle happened far more differently than in the main timeline. Regret didn't just stumble upon Earth with a small fleet. 
This time, the entire Covenant Armada and High Cherry arrived in tow. Truly, it was almost commendable for how long humans lasted. The fight for Reach lasted about two and a half months, but the fight for Earth lasted almost four months. Even with less forces and against worse odds, the humans had put up quite a fight. The Covenant ground forces had dubbed this planet Inferno. The planet had been on fire for months, and from the flames, demons would appear at random and take out hundreds if not thousands of troops with them and disappear back into the flames. The humans had denied the Covenant control of their fate and their planet. When the Covenant had arrived, they took several weeks to find the portal to the Ark. Seeing as how the Ark was the place where all the halos could be activated, a human healer, presumably, one by the name of Halsey, had ordered the demons to stop the Covenant from reaching the Ark. The demons had deployed a bomb that had nearly wiped out half of the Covenant Armada. It certainly destroyed High Charity. And if High Charity had not put so much distance between itself and Inferno, it would have destroyed their only path to the Great Journey, the portal to the Ark. At the same time, the bomb had almost cracked the planet in half. Plate tectonics had taken over and buried the portal to the Ark once more. This time far closer to the center of the planet. The Prophets did not care for what happened to the planet. They had not stopped glass in it for weeks. Even the parts that were molten glass and lava, they just kept on burning. Their hatred and disgust for the humans was one thing, but with these demons refusing Using to die, there was no other option but to root them out, stem and all. The portal to the Ark had just been activated, and almost with perfect timing, a jackal reports to the new chieftain of the Brutes, Titus, younger brother of Tartarus, that they have slip space reports of hundreds of ships arriving. From out of slip space, an armada of over 2,000 ships arrives. Notably, amongst them, there is six supercarriers, each commanded by one of the heads of the Swords of St. Helios. The battle immediately commences with the Covenant caught unprepared, and some ships are in the middle of glassing and excavating Earth. The naval battle rages on while the sources and Helios try to determine what ship the Prophets are on board to enact vengeance with their own hands. The two other leaders of the sources and Helios who aren't in command of a vessel are on board the Appetite for Destruction. This vessel is commanded by Shipmaster Okradesis, an older elite, one with much experience but even more hatred under his belt. The Prophets had labeled him a heretic and he had been living in the sewers of San Helios for years. He had horrifyingly scarred himself in order to mask his own identity and try to live as close of a normal life as possible. But now that he had risen back up to Shipmaster, he meant to bring hell on the Prophets. Okradesis' crew pilot a phantom to the surface of Earth, carrying Swordmaster Zuzo and ex-priestess Zalan. The idea is for Zalan to communicate with whatever humans are left and try to have them unite their forces, but mainly because they need intel on what has happened here and what the prophets are digging for. Zuzo is there as protector. He had killed several demons before. He had only lost a battle once against one of their Spartans. And in this honor, he had branded himself with the markings of the warrior, B312. This brand served as a reminder of his failures and respect for the warrior. Zuzo had other markings on his body, one for each of the foes he had slain. He was looking to add two more for the prophets. But right now, his task was to find the demons still roaming this broken and burnt planet. The taste of ash kept seeping into their mouths. Rima had been taking lessons from the Swordmaster, but she was still not on par with even a regular average warrior. However, her senses had begun to develop. They had been traversing the glass remains for nearly half an hour, with occasional looks up into the sky to observe the battle. They all knew the outcome soon enough would be victory for the Swords of St. Helios, but the Covenant did not seem very desperate, which was more reason for the distress of their mission. With her new developed sense of spatial awareness, she could feel something was not right. Someone was watching them, but did not know from where. But it it seemed that Suzo had picked up on this as well. Right before she could take another step, a miniature crack in front of her shattered the glossy surface, and a projectile bounced just barely missing her. Rima Zalan fell backwards trying to clutch her sword as her plasma rifle went scurrying over a ledge. She was in shock. She hadn't even heard the bullet, and what was worse is that from the angle it had bounced, she realized the shooter was directly in front of them and they had missed it entirely. The Swordmaster immediately activates both of his swords and jumps in the way of the bullet's trajectory while looking around for the shooter. Only then they both hear a booming sound, a shot. They check themselves for any injuries. At this, even Suzo begins to sweat nervously but refuses to show any fear. Only then does Rima realize what the booming sound was. It had been the bullet that struck in front of her. The sound had been delayed almost 15 seconds. The shooter had to have been over 5 kilometers away. She could not even imagine how someone could see from one kilometer away, much less five, especially with all the dust and smoke in the air. 
They both scurried to cover, but ultimately it was fruitless. Before they had any time to react, several figures had emerged from the surrounding debris and shadows. Were these humans? She had never seen one in person, but all the stories she had heard and read stated them as short beings. These ones were all taller than her and carried themselves with, with zero doubt and complete confidence in their abilities to end her and her protector. She heard a female voice speaking in Sankili. This was strange. She was not aware of any other females currently on this mission, but she also noticed something strange with the dialect. It sounded like a funny accent with two sweet a voice. Rima looked over the direction the voice came from, asking them to state their business. Suzu refuses to speak and displays intent on attacking the figures. After a longer look, she realizes these are the demons, the Spartans. The ship's crew had mentioned them so often, they were surrounded. She had heard Suzu Votin was the greatest swords master alive, but she knew they would not beat these odds. She began trying to converse with the demon the voice had come from. Rima's first instinct is to say they're here to help, but the figure doesn't reply. She proceeds by telling them they came to offer a truce, an alliance even. The figure before her lowers its weapon and raises out one hand, with an exposed palm and a holographic figure appearing from it. A purple human female speaks to her once more. Now understanding that the voice came from a human construct, she's more at ease, understanding they are being friendly. Had they chosen their own language, it would have meant they did not care for a dialogue, but choosing the Zanghili tongue meant they could be reasoned with. With this thought in mind, she began speaking in the human tongue. I am Rima Sala, one of the eight. We came to extend help and propose an alliance to end the covenant once and for all. The human female responds with, I am Cortana, and you might be too late. Every fiber of Kelly's being was screaming at her to kill every elite on sight. She knew she could. She could put down half the crew before they realized what was going on. But Chief had told them this was the only way the war could end without humanity going extinct. Every Spartan on board the Shadow of Intent was having the same problem. They had failed to protect Reach and now Earth. The UNSC must have broken by now, she thought. They had received more help than they expected though, but the fight for Earth was an unwinnable slaughter. Every Spartan left alive was recalled to Earth, and she had even been surprised to learn there was a new class of Spartans. But what took her most by surprise was to see a brother she thought dead long ago. Kurt051, along with his class of Spartan 3s, had arrived from Onyx. Because the Great Schism was triggered earlier, Onyx was only occupied by humans and no giant battle took place. However, a lot of the drastic measures taken during the conflict directly led to the discovery of the shield world inside. This time around, such discovery was not made, thus leading the way for less battles on planet Onyx and a lot more Spartan 3 survivors. With all these Spartan trainees and graduates, the addition of several more fully trained Spartans had managed to turn the tide against the Covenant, even if only for a small minute moment. The Spartans had managed to plant the UNSC's most powerful weapon on board the High Charity. The Master Chief had led an assault on High Charity when the floating city had taken a landing zone hovering above what used to be New Mombasa. The Prophets of Mercy and Truth were preparing to activate the portal, but an entire company of Spartans rained down on them. The class of Spartan 3s was led by Tom and Lucy on board High Charity, while the Master Chief and his Spartan 2s used Cortana to activate all of High Charity's defenses to stop any boarding parties, and they kept the landing zone safe. They had learned that the Covenant had split up, and therefore all the ships around Earth were what was left of the Covenant. At this point, the entire planet was vacant and a marble from all the glassings. So the chief being in command decided their lives were worth extinguishing the entire Covenant, even at the cost of Earth. What good was Earth now but a symbol of the broken spirit of humanity? While securing the landing zone, they had also managed to kill the Prophet of Mercy. Their sacrifice and plan had almost worked. They had all been prepared to die and let humanity rebuild from whatever colonies were left out there outside of the conflict. The Spartans felt like this was the closest thing to a victory they could have with these odds, and they hated it. They had been taught to seek victory, to make victory happen when the odds were a billion to one. And it all would have gone according to plan, but the Prophet of Truth had given the order to assault High Charity at full force, or else their great journey would have been, or else their great journey would be ended too soon. The hundreds of Covenant ships that assaulted High Charity overwhelmed its defenses and retook partial control of the ship. Even with all the Spartan 3s on board, they managed to pull High Charity out of orbit from Earth and took it as far away as possible before the Nova Bomb on board exploded. Seeing the floating city start to move, Master Chief pulled his Spartans back and they took refuge underground. 
the Nova Bomb exploded along with half of the Covenant fleet and the victims had been Jupiter, Mars, and Luna. Earth had been cracked open and the Continental Drift had remodeled Earth anew. But Master Chief's luck did not hold out enough. Half of the remaining Spartans died, either protecting the LC or from the following weeks of massive earthquakes that caved in the ground beneath and above them. Knowing they had lost, Cortana suggested a change in tactics. If they couldn't win and they couldn't afford to lose, they would force a stalemate. For almost a month before encountering the Swords of San Helios, the Spartans ran guerrilla counter ops against the Covenant. Anytime they landed and tried to activate the portal, the Spartans would be nearby to stop them. This is when the Covenant decided to wait them out. They would glass the entire planet 24-7 in an attempt to kill the Spartans from orbit, as every single effort to land on ground had turned into indistinguishable dust. Their main objective was to stop the Covenant from heading through the portal, and plan B was to go through the portal themselves and stage a defense of the Forerunner installation. After the fall of Earth, they were extremely surprised to see even more Covenant ships arrive on Earth, months after the battle was all but done. But not even Cortana had anticipated what happened next. The new fleet around Earth had engaged in combat with the previous one. Cortana's new plan had been simple. The enemy of my enemy is my friend. With the eight leaders of the Swords of San Helios, they called themselves by their titles such as the Left Thumb of San Helios. Cortana was fluent in San Heli, but even she wondered if her translation software was working correctly. These titles seemed a little silly for her liking, but the elites had explained the titles referred to the San Heli hands. The right hand is the hand of the warrior, where the sword is held, and the left hand is the hand of honor, where all the matters not pertaining to battle were handled. Family, duty, culture, and honor. Here they all met with the Swords of San Helios, on board the Shadow of Intent. Spartans had acknowledged they would not be able to stop the next push the Covenant made for the portal, and had chosen to ally themselves with the aliens. Kelly had not been particularly paying attention at the conversation. She had been focused on making sure they could get out of there at a moment's notice. Furthermore, she wondered if it wouldn't be too hard to just completely take over the ship and use it for their own needs against the Covenant. What had caught her attention was Master Chief's voice. He spoke with sorrow and pride in his voice. Kelly felt the weight of Master Chief's words heavy, as he was now speaking for all of humanity. They had proclaimed the truce with the Swords of San Helios and its allies. The Chief had asked for their help. The last time she could recall John asking for help was 33 years prior. During a training exercise where Chief Mendez had designed a battle with zero chance of success. One such that would require John to ask for help in order to prove a lone wolf can't beat a pack. Chief states that they must follow the portal and head to the Ark, where they will end the Covenant once and for all, and stop them from activating the rings. At the mention of the Halos, a new construct made itself present, one Master Chief had told them about. This was 343 Guilty Spark, the monitor of Installation 04. The Spartans all immediately prepared to fire upon it, but similarly, the elites prepared to do combat. After apologizing, Guilty Spark begins to explain to them they need to hurry if they want to stop the rings from being fired. Even without his installation, they would sterilize all life in the galaxy, and without the Flood, this was certainly not the intention of his creators. With all preparations made, the Arbiter decides to take the fiercest warriors in his fleet through the portal and leave their strongest ships on this side to end the conflict here once and for all. The Spartans will go through the portal as well, and one will stay behind as sort of a liaison with the Swords of San Helios. Fred is chosen as Fred is chosen as he is Master Chief's second in command, and Chief believes Fred always had better people skills. Amongst the Spartans to go through the portal includes Master Chief, Kurt, Linda, Naomi, Kelly, Adriana, and Leon, which is also the order of command now. From the Swords of St. Helios side, we have the Arbiter, Suzo, his apprentice Rima, and Hassel as shipmaster to ensure both a land and air victory upon the Covenant. On the journey to the Ark, they have a few days to relax. The Spartans are given food and water. Though uneasy to eat, the planet had been inhospitable to any form of life after the battle for Earth, and they had ran out of rations long ago. They had all been malnourished and fatigued. They aren't trusty of the aliens, but Cortana had determined the food would be safe to eat, especially with their metabolism metabolism and genetic superiority to average humans. The weeks they spent in slip space still doesn't bring them any closer to calling the others friends, but it does serve in the way for the ex-covenant to see them more as people and not demons. 
The biggest takeaway for their little adventure is that Leon and Suzo duel almost to the death. Leon had been a sword wielder since the day he killed his first elite. He almost defeated Suzo, and truth be told, he might have been able to, but Suzo's sword style was absolutely unpredictable, and in the end, even a mighty Spartan 2 could not defeat him. Not after the lessons he learned from fighting B312. Rima observes the fight very carefully, as she is Suzo's apprentice at this point. Linda gets to have some target practice with a beam rifle. Naomi and Kelly spend a lot of time with Rima, as something about a female elite just fascinates them. Lastly, Adrian Adriana has been traveling the ship up and down, trying to memorize every inch of it in case she needs to stow away or hijack a Covenant supercarrier. She has always wanted to take a supercarrier and not have to destroy it for once. Once they arrive on the Ark, they quickly go to work on both a naval and ground battle. Even with the reduced number of ships, the swords are beating the Covenant easily. The ground team has been split into three groups. Chief's idea was to get Spartans used to working with their previous enemies. Alpha team is Chief, Linda, and the Arbiter. You know, just as a little nod to the other what ifs. Wink wink. Bravo is Suzo, Rima, Leon, Naomi, and Kelly. The last team is Charlie team along with Kurt and Adriana, as well as a grunt, two elites, and a brute. The Swords of St. Helios has allowed certain individuals of all species into their alliance, and this was a chance for them to work together. The events that happen on the Ark are almost the same as Halo 3's mission, The Covenant. While on Earth, they had kept a few humans alive to use them in activating the Forerunner technologies. But because the constant delays from Spartans, the only one left alive was Admiral Hood. Johnson had given his life to protect him, and being the highest ranking member of the UNSC meant he was the most important alive now. The three teams split to deactivate the three towers which hold the shield to the citadel. The activation of the Ark has almost begun when all teams converge on the location. While the naval battle was going extremely poorly for the Covenant, they still had plenty of forces on the ground. All teams worked together to eliminate the Covenant forces. Kelly can be found running around all over the place to set up traps and be a distraction, while Leon and Suzo prefer to hop into the middle of a battle. Leon has begun practicing using two swords like Suzo, and the two of them are cutting brutes in half. The closest thing they have to a challenge is being surrounded by a dozen hunters, but together they cut and melt through the like logo. Linda has acquired a camo unit from one of the dead elites and climbs up the snow to stop any troops from making it inside the citadel. The fight includes far too many spines for the Covenant to have any remote chance. This may not be the most climactic fight ever, but it's still intense as they're running out of time before they force Hood to activate the Ark. Chief and the Arbiter clear a path inside, and Suzo runs after them. He wants nothing to do with this alliance if it's not to kill the Prophet and one day the Banished. Kelly catches up with them well after they had a huge lead on her. Chief orders Kelly to go ahead forward and try to get to Lord Hood or the Consul first as the Brutes are pushing him into activating it. Just before Kelly can reach them, however, Titus approaches Kelly with a gravity hammer with the intent of knocking her down to the bottom floor. But she's just too fast for him. She dodges the hammer strike by stepping backwards, runs up the hammer's hilt, and backflip kicks Titus in the face. This spells out doom, however, as another brute with a fuel rod shoots at them both to stop Kelly. The explosion of plasma melts Titus's right side almost entirely, killing him instantly. But Kelly's shields manage to take the brunt of the damage. Unfortunately, her shields need to cycle, and the explosion of the fuel rod pushes her along with her momentum. She still ends up falling down the citadel. Lord Hood takes this opportunity of the brutes being distracted to run away. His intent is for the brutes to be dumb enough to shoot him, but it does not quite go as planned. Hood sees in the distance the Master Chief and accompanied by elites. Something in the Admiral tells him humanity is going to be alright. He shares a very quick glance with the Master Chief and nods. Admiral Hood leaps off in the same manner which Kelly fell. For an old, beat up, unaugmented human, this was certainly death. Chief raises his hand reflexively, as if to try to catch him from a hundred yards away. Cortana momentarily grieves with him by simply saying, He's gone, Chief. I'm so sorry. Chief is now pissed off. The path to the Prophet is riddled with the toughest brutes in the Covenant Empire, but that means nothing to this team. Suzo has gone into a bloody rage, and the Arbiter is taking his time murdering every elite and brute in his path. The few elites who still believed in the Great Journey and had not deserted the Prophet were also here. The only one worth the Arbiter's time is a single elite whose wife mate had been very helpful to the Sword of San Helios before they had all known he was on the wrong side. Jewel and Dama steps up to confront the Arbiter, but is almost immediately dispatched. The Arbiter tells him, I gave you a quick death as a favor to Raia. When they reach the Prophet, he is trying to shoot at them with a brute spiker, but Zuzo is blocking the spikes with his swords. The Swordmaster puts both of his swords up against the Prophet's throat and tells him, For your lies, 
for all the lives you've destroyed. For your lack of honor, I sentence you to banishment. The great journey ends now. As he cuts the prophet's head clean off, at this point, most members of the group had caught up. As soon as Suzo lets out a roar, the Arbiter follows, and from all over the Citadel, they hear roars of both elites, brutes, and even some grunts. It seems as though the Arbiter had been transmitting Suzo's execution of truth to both the Swords of St. Helios and the Covenant. The Master Chief all the meanwhile is looking down the abyss to see Hood and Kelly. Kelly had caught Hood, but it did not matter. His body could not handle the fall. She only did it out of respect to stop his body from splattering and allow him to have a dignified death. Kelly looks up to Chief and then forward as she carries the body of Admiral Hood with both her hands. Suzo takes the head of the Prophet and adds one more cut to his body with the red and the blue sword, the marks of his enemies and a symbol of his revenge. By the time Kelly reaches the entrance, all the Spartans except for Chief are waiting there. They all salute to the Admiral's body as he made the ultimate sacrifice to ensure the Covenant could not fire the rings. After seeing the Spartans, the toughest warriors in the universe display this much respect. Some of the aliens salute the Admiral's body. They don't quite understand the gesture as of right now. But this, like many other human traditions, will soon become a staple tradition to all cultures in the galaxy. February 15th, 2559. The planet Onyx has become a home to humanity. Efforts to recolonize Reach have begun with the help of the new alien allies. The UNSC still exists and is a major governing body for humanity. But with Earth all but a piece of rock, the ruling government in the galaxy is the UIGC, the United Interspecies Galactic Council. There is a huge celebration on planet Onyx, which ultimately leads things back toward the main timeline slight. Although about four years late, the rest of the installation is revealed as the shield world within the slip space bubble expands, creating the new supersized planet. As both respect and a show of good faith towards humanity, the planet is named New Earth, where although humanity is the most populated here, all aliens are now welcome to live within. 